everybody begins, it's the, the, the anticipation builds up. And now everybody is, uh, is expecting a great conference. Coming from nothing or from Nossum, yes. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me be born while we agree. Yes, whom we should thank for, for the initiation of the whole, the whole thing, yes. And uh, it's, it's time, uh, so this is uh, uh, officially, this is the beginning of the conference, the official opening of the conference. And the first talk is a, co is a joint event with the computer science co -op. And we're using the facility and the uh, and, uh, logistics to that. And also, of course, this, the, the first speaker has a lot of privileges. And uh, one of them has unlimited time compared to at least other speakers. So math, uh, I was a student at Moscow University. And we all studied seminal or its papers on the, uh, how we should say this part consistent arithmetic, yes? If you say it openly, open line, so it consists, uh, or arithmetic with the, uh, with the what's it called, distinguished number? Yeah, that's true. It was following the work of Jesse and Wolpe. Yeah, yeah that's mm -hmm. true, but I, uh, at this time I didn't know that you followed the work of Jesse and Wolpe, and, uh, and so the complexity of proofs paper, too. And uh, the, when my, uh, my friends back then, they learned that I'm, I saw the great Rohit Parikh. It was the mid-90s, in person when I came from Cornell to Rohit's conferences and seminars at the end of my life. And I, th I still believe that this, this reflects the right status of Rohit in the mathologic community. He, is, uh, he boldly goes where nobody went before and opens uh, really new horizons with elegance and uh, mathematical power and convincing power. And uh, uh, he is the classic of the field in mathematics. Uh, well, maybe I'll just do the computer science uh, right away. Well, the computer science, when you look at the list of publications in market, and uh, this is like, um, there's one big paper which grabs almost half of, the, of his citations. And this is the, uh, the, the grammar paper, yes? And, uh, the Kuchomsky. The Kuchomsky, that's true. And uh, this, this is an absolute classic in, uh, in computer science. And uh, uh, traveling from one textbook to another, sometimes without proper reference. <laughs> but still, everybody knows that's the strongest result. And uh, uh, it's still classics. And, uh, God Almighty knows that it's you who did this. And this would warm your heart. Even uh, in the Web of Science also knows this. And Google Scholar knows this and all other references. So the, 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 classic, the, the classics of computer science is right there. Never regret a single second of all that. So I, I learned, I don't know how much I can bring to the philosophy, but I learn a lot. And thank to people like Stephen. Graham were present here and many others would be grateful for this combination of virtues and interests which are just in this place. And now, so Rocket, thank you. Okay, well I'm here I guess on behalf of the philosophy department. Um, and uh, let me say it's a great pleasure and an honour to be here uh, to celebrate Rocket's career and his 80th birthday uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be a little part of that. Um, Rohit is, of course, a great mathematician, um, but I'm not going to talk about that, partly because Sergei has said some things already, and partly because, uh, I mean, many of the people here will know his mathematical work better than I do. Um, but I did want to say something about Rohit as an academic citizen, because this is something we don't often talk about on occasions such as this. So, uh, Rohit was appointed to uh, CUNY in 87, okay? And since then, he has, uh, to my count, supervised um, 11 students to their PhDs. Uh, five in computer science, three in mathematics, and three in philosophy. And that says something about the breadth of his interest, and of course, about his commitment to students in the program. I know there are many students, right, 
who deeply respect you and have um, profited enormously from your help over the years. Um, and of course, in a sense, that's his job. That's you know the jobs you work here. Doesn't mean that you, you know, there's a difference between doing it well and doing it badly. But of course, there's much more to being a good academic citizen than that. And uh, Rohit has played an important role in the philosophy department over the seven years that I've been here. Not teaching research and research, I don't know. He's a regular. But it is only part of the world's philosophy. And if you want to call yourself a philosophy department. And not do for Western philosophy, and, and only do, and not do Eastern philosophy. You should just call yourself a Western philosophy department and make yourself honest. Now, Rohit has stood up for the Asian traditions many times on the executive committee. Um, we haven't had a lot of success yet, Rohit, but we're still plugging away, at it, mate. Um, so Rohit appreciates the fact that philosophy is now a global subject and it has been for two and a half millennia, and. Uh, I, I welcome the time when, uh, under his pressure and people like him, the Asian philosophical traditions are represented in uh, Anglo cultures. So that's, that's one thing. Um, that's the sort of subject matter. But there's also a question of people who are minorities. So um, the uh, faculty of the philosophy department are nearly all white males aging white males, it must be said, um, which is not good. Uh, and uh, Rohit has been a stalwart defender of getting people who are not aging white males appointed. Again, we haven't had a lot of success yet, Rohit, but we're pushing. So he's been pushing for people who, who belong to minorities, whether they're Asian women. I, 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 I find it hard to hear women as a minority, you know, because they're the majority of the world's population. Anyway, you know what I mean, okay? So whether it's been women, whether it's been Asians, whether it's been people of colour, uh, Rohit has always been there to, to advocate for them. And I, I think you've done a fantastic job, Rohit. Thank you for that. So that's all I'm going to say, except um, Rohit, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And we're going to do this again in 10 years when you're 90, mate. Yep. We had the idea to, to produce a volume uh, for Rohit. Oh, wow. And, uh, this is hot off the press, so I haven't even really uh, opened it myself. But I have seen the cover, and I was uh, one of the three editors, uh, along with uh, John Baskent and uh, Marajan. And, and so we have a, a whole uh, flock of authors who, who are here kind of uh, in spirit with you today, and we will, we will let them know. And so uh, I hereby present you with the volume in your honor. Okay. Yeah. My honor, so we're going to introduce once again Yan Wan Ik. Ike, yes, yes. Ike, of course it's German, yes, it's Ike, the rest of the news. And finally, there's a topic, it is connected to all of these, but it's connected to the, it's also connected to the volume that uh, Rubik is holding, because this is a concept of money. So I think that if you really want to do social software, that this is a key thing that you should uh, analyze. And this, so this is what you know already about, for instance, about um, um, some blood type, how common it is among the population. Okay. I give this as an example of how one, yeah, how one should do this. So this is an example of <coughs> rationality. As, uh, and, uh, this is, of course, you want to picture yourself as the guy who's standing here, but you don't know. Uh, people use, uh, they, they keep uh, 125 of these light bulbs burning all the time. I buy a copy of it and I, I give them away to people because like, this is the kind of thing that I, I think people should read. I own this book from that time uh, and I read it, but I, I reread it again and now I understand it much better than I did then. Um, communities in the United States, so they collect money to fly him over from Australia because he gives such inspiring talks and he can explain why their literal belief in the Bible is justified. So it's, this guy is a genius. Well, but I haven't met him. I just heard him talk about him. <laughs> okay, so now, okay, so I have met him, and I have. He has a. He's, he's a Vietnamese monk. He was kicked Thai, out Thai. of Vietnam. Sorry, right. yeah, he's Vietnamese. He's Vietnamese. He was kicked out yeah. of Vietnam. After, yeah, what is really true about how you relate to other people? That's a kind of uh, first-person perspective on social. And it's, uh, 
So I transformation. I transformed the garbage in myself so that you do not have to suffer. I support you, you support me. And uh, thank you for your attention. There was a universal forgiving algorithm. You know, we just go to proceed with the party. Oh. <laughs> but if there is a discussion thing, I would suggest moving it to the party. Yes, yeah, so I think it was, a, it was a very inspiring talk. I was afraid I was going to the Roman Catholic. But you know, you want to be But then later I discovered that's not so much about the. Yes. Yes, are you? We were teaching at here at the graduate center. Most of the world, we never it's it's a video it's a video it's a video so you know prove something yeah prove something oh okay <laughs> <laughs> no means yes. Yeah, no means yes, but but, that, but that, that's ahead. your logic. <laughs> well, I, I just uh, we we spoke about Professor Parikh as a mathematician, as a computer scientist, as a philosopher, and I want to say just uh, three minutes about Professor Parikh as a as a classroom teacher and as a friend. Okay, I took Professor Parikh in 1988. As an undergraduate, I took a master's class. We went through Cutland's computability theory. And he was able to, if you start low enough, you can get anything. And I, I as, a, as, a, as a teacher, have always used that, yes. that thing. That's Professor Parikh as a classroom teacher. He's by what, by what uh, merit and grace, uh, you decided to work with me uh -huh. on um, topology and logic, of all things. Hmm. And I, um, you know, I was, I was like, 27, 28 or something like that, and, and um, it was extremely generous of, of, of Roy to, to want to work with me, and I, I always felt that all of my interactions with, with Roy were really um, generous on your part. Um, um, I feel like Rohit noticed me, and it was, um, I don't know, maybe 85, or eight. so uh, the main character said that, why don't we remove the middleman and just connect <laughs> the, the tubes, and then Rohit uh, forgot the name of the main character. Ten years ago, when we had this uh, project on social software in, in Barcelona, in, in NIAS, and I once I told him, it occurred to me that uh, uh, Rohit is following the Indian tradition, so later in life, so you decide to uh, concentrate on things that really matter, so <laughs> they, 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 they don't need a raise. Great, thank you. But I'm very proud of the fact that Rohit and I have week number one or at least I have three number one, because we co-authored a paper a number of years ago when the International Congress of Mathematicians was taking place in India. And uh, we were asked to write a paper on the history of mathematics in India. And it was a daunting task, and I could not have done it myself, but I asked Rohit if he would join me, and he was gracious enough to do so. And it was then that I discovered, not only does he know a great deal about mathematics and logic and computer science, but he has a really good knowledge of history of mathematics, particularly in India. <laughs> right, okay. So I know Professor Parikh since uh, 2000 when I took an artificial intelligence course that had nothing to do with artificial intelligence, but everything about logic, I think. It was a great course, and I, I spoke in, in his seminar after, and uh, I was so stressed out at the time that I didn't eat anything, so I asked a friend to go get me chocolate, that's why. He always remembers. I, had, I hadn't even heard of game theory until I took your class, and I ended up getting a PhD in game theory, <laughs> so I'm grateful for that. But, um, and a full-time job. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but not in game theory. <laughs> no, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but and after every meeting, I would either text my sister, oh, I learned this today, but it had nothing to do with game theory. I mean, I would learn a lot about math and logic, but I would also learn so much on the side. Fascinating. Whatever 
idea came with you always have it in your dance certificate. And then remember there is a famous Russell example. That's about prime minister's name starting with starting with B. And the agent who knows this, uh, who who discusses this, has two pieces of evidence. One is because the last prime minister name, the last prime minister was uh, Bannerman, or the last minister name was Mr. Balfour. And this time, well, the first was the, 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 the later was the was the former was the right answer. Uh, so there is this situation where there are two wrong two reasons. One is good, and one is wrong for a true sentence. And try to model it with a model logic, you're dead. It cannot handle this. And Rocket immediately comes with an Indian answer. There is a smoke on the mountain. And the agent think, oh well, this is probably a fire there. But it was just a cloud. But and best known to the, the guy, there was indeed a smoke, uh, there was a fire on the mountain. Oh. <laughs> so there are, there are two reasons, and uh, the, the whole thing is quite isomorphic. So if you, if you go back to the ages, you can find a lot of answers. Of course. Uh, make jokes at everybody's expense. So let me start with Joe Dobbin, who is not, right next to me. Yes. Right? I mean, he's talking about my deep knowledge of the history of mathematics. But actually, he's the one who knew it all, right? <laughs> the thing is that he wanted an Indian co-author. So he asked me, I agreed, and I'm not saying I contributed nothing, right? But he knew about 10 times as much as I did. With the name of an Indian on it, then the paper got accepted. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how it is. So, and, and the thing about it, okay. now coming to chalk, Right. <laughs> now, I remember saying to Artemos at one time, Chol is brilliant. And he just said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember... Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 I'm giving a talk in Artemos seminar, and then I said the following counterexample is due to Chol Tastoni. And then when I looked at her, she had covered her face like that. <laughs> I mean, she wanted to do the work, but she didn't want to accept the credit. And then we had a conversation with, uh, with Robert Auman, who is a Nobel Prize winner in economics. There were two issues we discussed. Auman didn't know either of them. I'm not, I'm not bashing Auman, but it so happened he didn't know either of them. Charles knew both of them, right? And then, I mean, here we were, you know, talking to a Nobel Prize winner. And what did she do? She walked away. <laughs> right. And then Larry Moss, the work that we did, actually, again, it was the same thing. It was a little of my saying, this is wonderful mountain, shouldn't we climb it? Right? And Larry said, yes, yes. And then he climbs to the top of the mountain, and he said, this is a joint paper with Rohit and me. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, all the hard work in that paper was his. You're I trying just, to show the best of you. Yeah. <laughs> no, You're succeeding. Yes. No, it's just, it's, I just came up with a definition. And you and I worked for a long time coming up with exactly the right definition of knowledge in topological spaces. But the technical work was yours. You admit it, right? So, <laughs> so, but when I, came to, when I came to New York from Boston, Uma's mother, Carol, was really very upset with me. And so the first time? Oh yeah, it was the first time. It was not the first time. It was not the first time. But she was very upset. Right? Okay. And she's, we had a good life in Boston, right? And I had a good job at Boston University. Why leave, right? But then, now I would say to her, I wouldn't know all these people if we had them. Right? And she knows many of them, right? And Uma knows practically all of them. So it's not like leaving Boston was entirely a loss. It was a huge gain. So I would say thanks to CUNY for, you know, all these people.
Logic and Society. Today's conference, we're going to start, we're going to be here all day in this room. And to the program is okay. So, we're going to open with Alessandro Carbon from Paris and the social behavior of proteins. Thank you so much for coming. So, um, so hi, everyone. And uh, I'm actually happy to. To be I'm, here. I'm actually happy to be here. Okay. <laughs> Yesterday I didn't make uh, any small speech about you, and uh, but in fact I must say that um, that uh, that I came here in CUNY. I just say two words now. Okay. So I just came uh, here in CUNY because I wanted to work with you. Oh wow. So That's this was the reason no. actually. I had everything settled down to to go to Amsterdam. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> and then up. Uh, there was this possibility, and then I came here. I was actually working on um, land for proofs, yes. and uh, so it was extremely interesting for me the possibility eventually to come. And um, so well, and uh, so I did my PhD here with you. And in any case, uh, so um, so along the years, uh, in any case, uh, uh, things uh, things moved. Uh, at least for me, in terms of, uh, of subject. And uh, right now I'm doing computational biology with uh, really no, no logic for the moment. And uh, so the point is that uh, I have a, a very recent paper, so this is the reason for which I put these types, uh, as a chains and then uh, as a text, like this one, uh, and uh, with letters. And describing uh, in a sort of a very realistic manner the crowded environment where proteins uh, live, uh, conserve the signals okay, when, uh, where the change takes place. And this is again an example uh, uh, of what the biologists can do. Okay, and uh, there is a little move. Maybe you want to see. And uh, for bacteria, what we need to realize uh, is uh, actually uh, molecular modeling. So, yes. Uh, is your work primarily experimental, computational, or theoretical? Mine? Yes. Computational. Computational. <laughs> and does it have any connection with your original work on proof theory or no connection? No, no connection. No. I tell people the story that you were interested in proofs, and proofs are like molecules, and so you became interested in molecules, and that's all. <laughs> it's a nice story. In this, uh, what happened is that in proofs, I was uh, interested in interactions. Yes, yes that's true. Right. Uh, and here, somehow, it's the same thing. And one thing that I wanted to do is to, to, to forget logic, yes. if you remember. <laughs> right. Okay, that's all my work, forgetting <laughs> logic. And get uh, and get information out of the geometry, okay. but uh, yes, 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 maybe see you in spirit. So we'll wait until we have the magic of. Uh, because <laughs> in, in in coming over here, I actually wanted to um to come to grips with uh, Rowing as a kind of uh, political thinker, so I had to actually to engage with. Uh, well, not just the logic, but actually the, the social world. And the, so the, this, the title of this meeting is what? The logic Society. So this is, yeah, Society. So I really want to, to engage with Rohit as a, as a social thinker. So this is uh, Rohit's uh, email message after the, uh, the election, where he thought that it, there were uh, silver linings. And he basically, so I want to look at this quote in, in uh, red here, where he, says, where he actually said that the Supreme Court ought to be Three, 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 liberal, conservative, and independent. So this, this talk actually does have a connection to, to circularity. So, as you all know, one of the interesting things about the uh, treatment of, of um, common knowledge is that it's sort of circular. So this talk here, what I'm doing today is um, is actually to do that. This talk that I gave to the 
to the undergraduate uh, philosophy guys, and it's mostly a discussion as it happens, so you can discuss it with me, but actually just skip a lot of it. So, uh, okay, so here's the kind of the opening kind of question. So, so why is it that people have different views that they're willing to kill each other about, and what can we what can we do about this? That in some sense is the is the main issue. And I take this in, in some sense to be an echo of your, your view, which is um, kind of why is it that people have strong political views that they're willing to, to, to hurt each other about and what can we do about this? So it's sort of consonant with your, your uh, position. Um, and so I would really like to think about uh, the foundations of, of pluralism, as it were. No, here's the thing I will, will refer to. Pardon me? I will, no, no, I will not refer to that. I, the people that I will refer to are these ones. Yes. So I will actually be, be, work, be uh, taking quotes from uh, these people. Uh, so this is who I will refer to. Now, th notice this is different than Derrida. Where Derrida's view is actually what you should do is you, should, you, you don't have any meaning whatsoever, so you might as well just say everything is equally good. Like you, if it was a political argument, you might say there none of the political theories are good. You might as well just allow allow them all you know random. But this one is actually saying they're all sort of great. So my my view is actually this. Uh, so this answer is sort of most of In a certain sense, this kind of negates fundamentalism. But it opens the way to learning from fundamentals, which is, it seems to be what it's, what it, I mean, that's, just, that's how I, I take it. Well, this is a great talk, but it ought to be a paper, because it's just too much stuff to take in during 40, 40 minutes. And probably yeah. you haven't taken in yourself. Am I right? It's not such an easy paper to write, but it's, <laughs> it's yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Yeah, that's possible. No, I mean, you're touching yeah. points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a lot more to say, but I didn't just skip over. Well, like it might be that there is no other just, self. Just right. embracing yeah. another self is a hard enough thing to do when you consider marriage, for example. Yeah. I mean, that I does also that also does lead to a, a, a take on who do you start talking with? Yeah, that's right. Super tolerance with you started with your family members, and then you could extend it to your students. So, uh, Constantinos. Gagatos from John Jay College on substance speech logic as a dynamic epistemic logic. All right, so, so Rashid, I think, is known for uh, his work on uh, uh, automata. There is a, okay, but there is one uh, topic which is very dear to me because I worked on it. And may, some people may think that uh, it wasn't very ambitious as a topic, nor groundbreaking, or a central. But uh, I want to show that actually that's not the case. And uh, well, it was one jointly by Larry Moss and me, right. and specifically jointly by Larry Moss and you. No, no, it uh, was you and uh, Larry Moss. So, <laughs> it's also, I think that it's also very Parikian. <laughs> okay, so in this further sense, in the sense that uh, uh, first it wasn't work that Rohit did on somebody else's uh, theory. It's a theory that he founded along with Larry. Okay, and it encompassed many of his uh, interests. Uh, don't be fooled by the 2002. That work was uh, 90 something, it only took her uh, uh, 10 years to publish it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, there is a very, very brilliant idea behind it. We can do that because we can uh, uh, change the subset, and change the subset means changing the domain, and therefore we can change the model within the language. And if the, if the uh, model is big enough, a universal model that can contain all possible relations and so on. Just by restricting the domain, you can, you know, have any model uh, possible. So, and uh, so happy birthday, mm -hmm. Rohit. I hope uh, you have many years of self happiness and uh, dreams. And uh, here's a virtual cake uh, for you. <laughs> well, that's it. So, but the question is. The, the Dell has, has many kinds of um, epistemic actions, but the simplest one is the public announcements. Yes. So would it be more accurate to say that the subspace logic is the humble man's but, public announcement logic? Because yes, it has yes, nothing like, it has yes, nothing yes, like a private announcement. Right, right, right. right. So is, right. That, is that more right? Right, but who says that nobody can come you okay, know, so with a could, different part? Yeah, or, uh, <laughs> you know, or something. You know. So is that an interesting thing to do? It is, it is. I, I think that, uh, you know, 
just because there is no central authority that uh, controls uh, subset space logic, I think it's <laughs> then if there was one, they would say, you take that, you do that, and, and then it makes it uh, more complete in that case. So that's why it's a humble. Route. The history took a different route there. And the, the second origin, which is uh, much closer to us in time, this is the syntactic, syntactic epistemic logic um, as, a type, uh, as, as a name was suggested by Robert Oman, uh, who identified the conceptual and technical gap between syntactic character of a game description, uh, because you, you describe the game in the language which is, which is available, which is understandable for your grandmother. And then you jump into the Pirkey model, which is not. Uh, in the epistemic scenario I, you go to its syntactic formalization. Of course, there is some dangerous in between going from I to SI. But still, we'll just ignore it for the moment. We acknowledge there are some problems, but that's not what we're discussing. So we end up with the syntactic formalization. Normally, with the examples we consider, they're pretty straightforward. You just formalize in certain uh, logic of knowledge with some extra assumptions. And l let's read that. So, so pragmatic semanticists, given a goal of G, because you have to know what, what you're talking about, what do you want from the story, and set of assumptions, delta, convince yourself, verify, assume, or those. the delta is actually sufficient to settle G. At this moment, an educated or over-educated epistemic logician is just go to sleep because, well, my children again, what, can, what you can possibly know about the whole thing. So the same criticism. So let, let, let's, let's, let's be specific. That's everybody's favorite centipede game. You know the dark matter theory, yes? And you see what you see in the sky and all the stars and wonderful starry nights, all the whole thing. This is the visible universe. And this is semantic approach. Nice and visible thing. But 97 whatever percent of the universe is dark matter. You don't see it. So here, complete scenarios are nice to handle. You can handle by any other, any tools in your disposal. You can build your own nice model theory, logic around things. And, but remember that this covers only 7% of the universe. It's true, just informally speaking. Most of the scenarios are dark matter, and it's better to, to it's the time to acknowledge this and to begin developing logical tools to handle it. And not leave it to engineers, quote unquote, game theorists who don't have, have no idea how to handle it. We do. Okay. Thank you. I go way back, all the way back to my graduate school days, and uh, he was my thesis reader and he was in my thesis committee, although my research area was, and his research areas were not uh, But we talked about formal languages. Yes. <laughs> and um, we did have joint publication under uh, social software. And uh, this I pulled out from my own web page where I have the complete list of my publications. Of course, this goes, goes back to the turn of the century. <laughs> and uh, and this, uh, this came about, th these publications came about when I was having talking informally with, with Rohit. So this is what you get by being friends with uh, <laughs> someone like Rohit. So this is one of my nuggets of Rohit and I that, that I want to share another nugget uh, of Rohit and I. Uh, here's a nice book. It's nice because I wrote it. <laughs> and, uh, and this is in my area, which is the overlap of computer science and biology, say biomatics. And uh, I have pulled out a page from this where I'm talking about parik mapping. And I've highlighted something. Can you read it? No. Uh, maybe no. you can. <laughs> uh, so, I, so I will uh, read it for you. That's a footnote I put. And I had sent it, I, these versions I sent to Rohit and I hope he agrees. And I don't know whether he read it at that time or not, but I'll read it for you. Which says, uh, this, is a, um, this is regarding Parikh mapping. So more than 40 years after the appearance of this seminal paper, during an informal conversation, Rohit Parikh, a logician at heart, told me that he had done this work in formal languages for money. <laughs> <laughs> he has a great sense of humor. <laughs> And he explained that as a graduate student, he was compelled to take a summer job that actually produced this work, which is part of all of our uh, This is true. Because <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. So
let me at the very outset acknowledge my team. Um, the work that I'll be presenting is you know, joint work with my team and other external collaborators. The therapy stems from the fact that no two individuals' cancers are identical. Cancer is a common disease, but it differs from patient to patient. Okay? And this is what we want to exploit in precision medicine. That means we want to have therapies uh, that target the molecular profile of a particular patient. So this is what, it, you know, what makes it possible. It's leaving the footprint behind on the genome okay, of, of, the, uh, of these cells. So on. And this is a global view called the circus plot, which actually is showing all the chromosomes and the changes uh, globally that you are seeing. And this is a list of the driver genes, usually studied by the molecular pathologist. And these are the list of drugs. No, again, this is what uh, we are currently working on. And this is not our hypothesis. This is the hypothesis of the community, that there is a notion of driver genes there. <coughs> Last year, Ayako Yamashita was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, a type of blood cancer. And the little theory that I'm going to present today, it's a little theory about a little semantic theory, actually comes from this work and it's sort of left lying around for ages, but in the context of something I've been working on recently, um, that, that grew out of this project with Rahit, uh, I've just come to see how I might actually use this in some way. Okay, so that's, a, that's the basic distinction. But of course, Grice actually wants to say this distinction goes away eventually. It's not a real distinction, ultimately. Um, but here you can see where it look, looks like it's a real distinction, uh, because we've, we can use mean in this natural or in this non-natural sense. These, are, these senses both seem to be ambiguous. So take the, 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 the second one of these. Tom's frown meant that Tom was perplexed. That you can do it, there's a natural sort of frown, which people do when they're perplexed, let's say. But you can also do a, a, a copy of one, an imitation of one. And very often you get a sort of fusion of, of the two, when you, a natural one starts and you notice it, and then you sort of get in and ramp it up a bit. Uh, you can get something like this. A competent speaker can assert x means y if s takes x to be evidence for y by virtue of being either a situation that's the cause of y, uh, a situation that's an effect of Y, or a situation that is part of a situation that includes Y. If you look at, usually Tigger's purring means he's content. So now we've got the Lewis adverb of quantification, and we've got the word means in there now. Um, well, we've lost activity because, look, Tigger's not purring, but usually Tigger's purring means he's content. It's true. Right? So in some sort of superficial way, it seems, we've lost activity. Right? If Tigger's purring means he's content, if Tigger's purring means he's content, then he's purring. But if usually Tigger's purring means he's content, it doesn't seem to follow that he's purring. What follows is that in any situation in which he is purring will be a situation in which he's content. But that's just what you get from the conditional anyway, right? So there's nothing. So it's as if this usually, usually he's either doing something very strange here, or what it's pointing to is a real difference between singular meaning statements, which are the sort of philosophers have been interested in, and quantified or general uh, statements. And it looks like what holds for the singular doesn't hold for the general. And for good reason, one might think, that there is some intrinsic connection between, in, in, the, in the singular case, which may not tr come from anything fully general. Uh, the start of the afternoon session, <coughs> and I'm now sitting with a talk on height and happiness. So I'm looking forward to the happiness part. Who isn't? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Rowett just reminded me that, uh, or informed me, I should say, that uh, I'm the person in the room he's known the longest. And I think that works both ways. Uh, uh, yes, I'm quite certain of it. Uh, it's, it's been an honor and a, a privilege and a lot of fun over the years. Thank you very much, Rowett. So, this is... Um, picture of Rowett from 1991. Um, sometimes the outcomes are not that great. Um, but the talk has nothing to do with that. Uh, okay, so definite description, descriptions uh, need some machinery. Can you do away with the machinery? How much of it do you actually need? And proper names are rigid designators. And rigid is rigid. How can, how, how can things change? What's change of happiness? I have no idea. But uh, certainly a partial ordering. 
possibly transitive. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we compare the happiness of people. I don't know exactly what it means to compare happiness across people. But uh, actually this, uh, I think, is correct. <laughs> 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 that Peter Geach asked very long time ago, I mean, must be more than 30 years ago, uh, at MIT, which is to explain what it means to say that Jack's uncle was taller than he expected. Can you, can you formalize that one? That uncle was taller than he, Jack expected. Uh, the, the only thing I could do was do the, the obvious. You have the real world and your notion of the real world. Right. And then it's just more or less the same as the Alice example. Right. Now, I offer an explanation using numbers. And Geach objected to that on the grounds that the boy, that Jack might not know about numbers. Yeah. But that's OK with you, right? <clears throat> I don't know how to handle things like that, where you're talking about <coughs> objects you can't actually get together right. uh, in different times or something like that. Uh, without making some assumptions like that. So here's a situation. There are seven people, um, and these are their rankings over three candidates, A, B, and C. So this means that this group of three people ranks candidate A strictly above candidate B, strictly above C. But he's not this evil dictator that's trying to manipulate. He, in fact, he's completely unreflective. He just looks over, sees what the next person is voting, and says, oh, that's, that's how I'm going to vote. So that was just kind of a general comment about uh, universal domain. Um, it's a, po a point I think it's important to stress. Change the assumptions a little bit, and do you get something analogous? Um, what's so bad about manipulation? How hard is it to manipulate? Um, yeah, so but I think there's another. Um, I'm reminded of, of portfolio theory, where it's assumed that uh, an investor uh, always wants the lowest possible variance and the highest possible mean of return. And okay. you have a hidden uh, value function for each of these voters where they have a, a preference ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like uh, they're trying to minimize their variance by looking at how many others are voting for the candidate of choice. Mm -hmm. And they'd rather have a certain trade-off between safety. Uh, but you get those cases where you said uh, those 22 voters uh, decided to signal to others mm -hmm. uh, that they felt would reciprocate, but it was a risky move. So mm. they were choosing mm. higher variance mm. for a higher expected outcome because uh, that was their preferred um, uh, candidate choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 really interesting. Yeah, yeah. right. And suppose that um, it's you know uh, five to four, and I'm a single voter, and I want the four candidate to win. The only thing I can do is vote for that voter and make it five to five. So I've manipulated the outcome, but I created a tie. I can't, it's not, it's, you can prove that it's not single winner manipulable. Whereas board account is, has the sort of strongest form of manipulability. So really fleshing this stuff out is going to depend on how you deal with tie breaking, like how you think about tie breaking. Well, I, so what kind of vote do you want? Yes. No, no, that's, yeah. So in the end, you're assuming like, are you a risky voter? Are you an optimist? Are you a pessimist? Uh, what, what type of voter are you actually? I'm a pessimist. <laughs> <laughs>
something was changing in the way that I was thinking about two very important topics that were part and parcel of my education here at the Graduate Center. One was, of course, language. Um, this, the philosophy department at the Graduate Center is, of course, well known for its work in philosophy of language. Um, in those days, we used to have folks like Steve Schiffer and Martin Field work out here. Uh, it's also always known for its, um, its work in logic, and I had taken classes in epistemology, and I had been exposed to these propositional accounts of knowledge. I couldn't stop relating knowledge with action, that when you knew something or when you believed in something, it meant that you could do something. There was, very, there was a very elaborate and, uh, I would say, um, abstract style of thinking about meanings. I was also exposed to Wittgenstein through Professor Pari, and I had not studied Wittgenstein before then. Um, I had not studied him in my philosophy of language class, I had not studied him in any of my core philosophy classes. Um, when I was introduced to Wittgenstein, I was in introduced to him through Professor Parikh, and I think for a long time, the Wittgenstein that I knew was Professor Parikh's Wittgenstein. They would say these things that would unsettle me, that had these illusions that seemed to be very, that seemed to carry a great deal of significance, even though I couldn't quite figure out what they were getting at. But I had no work, my assistantship money had run out, and I was working as a waiter up on the west side, and to entertain myself, I used to go for long runs in Central Park. So by the end of the summer, I'd become thin as a whippet. I'd been given up drinking, and uh, I think Professor Brigg at one point said something to me like, you seem to be losing a lot of weight. And I said, oh, you know, I'm running, I'm not going out, I'm not drinking, I'm not doing all this and this. And he said, why are you doing all this? And I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to economize. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to live within my means. And I think a couple of questions, uh, a couple of further follow-up questions from Professor Greek revealed that I was just plain flat broke. <laughs> sort of out of left field as far as the current work and belief revision was concerned. Um, and uh, every belief revision theorist work is solved with come in and use the AG maxims as a base and proofs and representation theorem on the top of it. Um, so anyway, I, I, I just want to like wrap up, I, as I see, I'm constantly is standing out of time. I just want to say, um, I, <laughs> I, I often, I often, I, I often tell um, those that know, know, uh, know Professor Barit that I think when I started working with him, I, um, I had the sense as, as we worked through and I wasn't quite sure if I had um, if I disappointed him uh, because I turned out to be quite you know not as mathematically proficient as I think he uh, as I think he hoped I would be. But I think what I remain most grateful for is um, showing me in a certain way uh, that you could combine I think generosity and intellect. I, I've only had one PhD student so far, uh, but I think in my interactions with her. Um, I tried in many ways to emulate uh, Professor Parikh's uh, interactions with me, including buying her many, many, many cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>
very possibly the worst possible introduction to Wittgenstein. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I realized two things. One of them was the man was clearly a genius, and B, I had no idea what he was saying. <laughs> and then many, many years ago, uh, I, I started a course on Wittgenstein by Arthur Collins, who was then, then chair of the philosophy department. <coughs> and uh, Collins concentrated on uh, Kripke's book, right? You know, explaining Kripkenstein. And although I thought that Kripke had got Wittgenstein wrong, it was easy to understand once Wittgenstein, once once you say, this is Kripke Wittgenstein, and now how do we go to the real world? Okay. Then Krishnamurti is somebody that I heard about when I was teaching at Stanford. Uh, he he was he was a person who was a kind of a spiritual person who was absolutely anti-religion. And not only was he anti-religion, he was also anti-guru. Right? As far as he was concerned, truth was there, each person must find it for himself, don't follow anybody else. Right? But again, it's, it's absolutely brilliant man. Then the next person is my, then my wife and ex-wife now, Carol Parikh, and I've, you know, we've been together for 49 years, and uh, 26 years of being married, and 22 years of not being married, and certainly she's influenced a lot of my thinking. Not that I always agree with her, because she's a die-hard liberal, <laughs> die-hard centrist. And I remember that this difference came up very early, because even before we were married, uh, she and I both went to a march against Wittgenstein, and I wore a jacket and neck tie. You think mean a march against Vietnam? Vietnam? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. I, think, I think I was the only person no. there. You said, you said march against I Wittgenstein. Said, <laughs> I'm a Harvard man. We wear neckties. <laughs> <laughs> then the next person is Buddha, and I had not realized uh, through many years that, that the man actually was a genius. I mean, one could say uh, Jesus lived only 32 or 33 years, Buddha lived 80 years, and he had much more time to develop his views, and I would say, again, absolutely, the man was a genius. The next person is Jawaluddin Rumi, who uh, I, I was introduced to her by Carol to him by Carol, and once, uh, maybe for my birthday or something like that, she gave me a tape of uh, uh, some poems of Jalaluddin Rumi, recited by in English, right? And I had never even heard of Jalaluddin Rumi, but Carol knew that this was a man who was to my heart, right? So he belongs there. And the last person is Socrates, and again, Socrates I was introduced when I was reading <coughs> the Mino and the Theatetus, uh, with Adriana Renoro, who is a, a student in the philosophy program, and during the during the reading of uh, of Theaetetus, we discovered that almost everyone had misread Plato's theory of knowledge, right? And so we wrote a, pa a paper about that, which is going to be.